Hi folks, so today we're going to have a look at two contrasting earthquakes. I'm going to start by just drawing sort of our fault line down the middle of our book, or roughly, and then another one across your book. Okay, so the two case studies that we studied in class were Chile and Nepal. So I'm just going to put Chile here, which happened in 2010, and then Nepal here, which was 2015. Okay, so as we know, there were two similarly devastating um, earthquakes, very similar size as well. So Chile started out at an 8.8 magnitude earthquake uh, on the Richter scale and Nepal's earthquake in 2015 was 7.9 magnitude. So roughly a hundred times less impactful, uh, smaller. But we know that actually the impacts were f you know, far greater in Nepal because of course it is a low income country compared to Chile, which is a high-income country. We know Nepal is a low-income country because we know it has quite low wealth and also low services like healthcare and education. It's actually ranked 145th out of 187 countries. That's on the Human Development Index uh, sort of ranking. So really quite low down. Whereas Chile, on the other hand, is ranked 41st out of the same 187 countries for its Human Development Index. Okay, so Chile is a far, far more developed country. Now both earthquakes, as we said, caused quite substantial devastation. The one in Chile, caused quite a lot of buildings to be destroyed, just a, a smaller number than were destroyed in Nepal. So I'll just put some fractures in there. It was quite moderate building damage. And the cost of all the damage to be repaired was 30 billion US dollars. Now the reason that the cost was so high is because the cost of materials for those buildings, the infrastructure itself, was of a higher net worth than what we see in Nepal. Because as I said in Nepal, the damage to buildings was actually far greater. We had buildings on their side, buildings toppled over, really beautiful temples and other such things badly destroyed. But the damage, even though it was more widespread, the cost of the damage in US dollars was five billion dollars, uh, US dollars. And that's because, again, the type of infrastructure and materials and services were of a lower net worth, a lower quality than that that we see in, in Chile. Now, if we look at death toll, that's always a big indicator. In Chile, 500 people died. Okay. Remember, with these infographics, it's good to draw sort of pictures to help you remember the, these different facts. In Nepal, however, 9,000 people died. And there's a very good reason for that. Their buildings were not constructed with regulations that mean that they need to be earthquake proof. So we wouldn't have seen some of the strategies used in Chile over in Nepal. So sadly, many of these pe many of these deaths were down to um, buildings falling on them. Okay, so that was death toll. Of course, there are even larger numbers of people who are injured but not killed. So in Nepal, we were looking at approximately 12,000 people who were injured compared to 20,000 over in Nepal. 
and just a little hospital symbol, first aid symbol. So much, much larger numbers as you'll see. And then finally, earthquakes affect everybody, uh, particularly obviously those in that region, but even further spread with businesses lost, income lost and so on. Now the total number of people affected in Chile was quite staggering, you know, 800,000 people affected. But that was much smaller than the 8 million people who were either made homeless or lost their jobs or were stressed, lost a loved one and so on. Um, 8 million people affected in Nepal. Okay, so those, those are our comparison data. Now, alongside the deaths from the buildings being destroyed and the cost of it, there were other quite interesting sort of primary and secondary impacts. The one in, the, in Chile was a tsunami. Now, the tsunami was started, obviously, because of the destructive plate boundary that Chile sits on, and it affected coastal towns. Primarily, it didn't go too far inshore, thankfully. So. But coastal towns were affected. There were also inland, draw this, but sort of landslides, so coming down and hitting people's properties. So sort of small landslides. Okay. It's quite a mountainous area. Okay, and that brings us to a close on the sort of primary and secondary effects of the Chile earthquake. Now, when we come to Nepal, we've got to remember that Nepal is home to the Himalayas, which sit between China and India. And this is a mountain range that also happens to include Mount Everest, the largest mountain on Earth. It's a popular tourist destination and many people every year choose to climb Mount Everest. And I'll just draw some walkers for you. And with the aim of obviously making it to the summit. Now along Mount Everest there are base camps, there's other camps, and when this 7.9 magnitude earthquake struck, it affected people on Everest as well. In fact, it killed 19 people, 19 climbers, including Sherpas. And that's because of huge avalanches that made their way down the valley, just encompassing everything in their tracks. There we go. Now, along with the avalanches, the snow melt and other things made their way into rivers, causing river flooding. And on surrounding hillsides, we also saw landslides that we saw over in Chile as well. So some quite significant impacts. Now, finally, services were affected in both countries. Things like electricity, power cables, that kind of thing, they get taken out when there's an earthquake. They're one of the first things to go. The other thing that often becomes affected is water. So clean drinking water often is um, compromised and with that, people aren't able to access it. Now in Nepal, it wasn't just clean water that was affected, it was also sanitation. So toilets and things, um, pollution was rife. And then finally, I can draw a mobile phone, um, phone calls. Everyone is trying to use the same networks, they become jammed and communication is out the window. Not to mention any important roads going through Kathmandu were destroyed. So there was a real difficulty actually reaching people. Now over in Chile, we've got some very similar impacts. We've got that lack of power, 
lack of clean water, it's very common in earthquakes, and lack of communications and roads were damaged. Less badly, but there was some damage to roads. So what we've got here are two similar earthquakes, but with very different sort of scale of impact. And you could easily have a nine mark question that asks you to compare and contrast to different wealth areas and how they are able to respond or how they are impacted by a natural hazard. On the subject of responses, so this could be a separate question, we've got our short term responses, things that happen in the days, weeks, maybe months, maybe up to a year following the earthquake. Okay, and then we've got our long term responses. This can take many years for countries to recover from natural disasters of this sort of magnitude. So in the short term, Chile basically responded much better. Okay, they had the wealth, the infrastructure, remember that where are we, the 41st richest and, and better off country, more developed out of 187. So they were able to basically repair those roads that were damaged, which meant that they could get that much needed uh, food, water, medicine, accommodation to people in need. And those key roads were actually repaired in just 24 hours. Which is fantastic. And remember we said they were sort of without power, you know, electricity shortages, that kind of thing. Well, power and water so that's that clean drinking water that we all need, was restored in just 10 days. Which is fabulous. And not only that, because obviously we, had, we did have building damage, we had people's homes were damaged, Chile set about making many, many, many wooden huts. Almost like a chalet, or a really sort of quite nice shed. Um, big enough for a family to live in. And they made these wooden um, chalets very, very quickly and they made 30,000 of them. And they called them their emergency wooden shelters. Okay, and that made a significant difference to people who were affected by that um, earthquake, that 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake. Now, if we go over to Nepal and we look at the 7.9 magnitude earthquake, we think about all those things that have happened, the avalanches, the river flooding, the landslides, the buildings destroyed, and all those many, many people affected. What did they do? Now, they d they're not the wealthiest country. They're quite low in terms of their human development index ranking, so they couldn't really help themselves a great deal. Instead, they put out a plea. And the plea was to NGOs to come in and help them. Now, anyone who doesn't know what an NGO is, it's a non-governmental organisation. Okay, and these are organisations like charities like Oxfam. People who are able to come in at a moment's notice, bringing with them lots and lots of people so what we really need is doctors, we need nurses, we need social workers, we need search and rescue teams. So people are a great resource and with them, on the trucks and things like that and boats, they bring with them lots and lots of supplies. And this will be things like food, emergency food, rationed food, be that much needed clean drinking water and it'll also be sort of medical supplies, you know, things to dress people's wounds, antibiotics to treat infections, that kind of thing. Now remembering where Nepal is and remembering the, the issues that we had up on Everest and in the other mountainous regions, and also let's not forget those, those damaged roads, often because of landslides the roads would be covered in rubble, what they needed 
was well were helicopters and the helicopters were actually able to get into places that other place other cars couldn't get to other people couldn't get to so the helicopters took in search and rescue teams to actually go in there dig through the rubble and find people and try and rescue them and they did supply drops, so they would actually drop down sort of crated goods and just drop them in sort of remote, kind of mountainous areas where people were stranded, sometimes for days, often, I think it was a week or two weeks, some villagers were left in these stranded and remote areas. So dropping down supplies to them is, you know, incredibly helpful in these remote areas. Another thing they did is they just urged people to leave Kathmandu. Now Kathmandu is the capital of Nepal and it's a very crowded area with lots and lots of buildings, lots and lots of people. And they just said, you know, if you can get out of the city, do get out of the city. And so people just took it upon themselves to go and stay with friends, family, in other places. And they just left, they evacuated. And that 30,000 people chose to do that in the short term just to get away from Kathmandu. Now in the long term they needed more substantial help. Things like repairing those roads which is you know it's a costly operation and they needed money to do that. So I'm trying to draw a bag of money here. Um, the money needed to be brought in as aid from other countries because as we said, they're not the wealthiest country in Nepal. They don't have the funds and the economy to support their own recovery. So instead they would sort of hold conferences and make pleas for other countries to bring money in. Now, if we go back to Chile in the long term, well, they took time. It took sort of four years actually to make a full recovery, which sounds actually like a long time but there are parts of um, Kathmandu and Nepal which have still not recovered and won't do for many years to come so actually four years to make a full recovery it's actually quite impressive and it's even more impressive that they did it with their own sort of strong econo economy and government Okay, so what we need to remember is that both earthquakes had primary and secondary effects and that they had devastating effects on the lives of people and their activities. But Chile was more prepared, more experienced, more wealthy and able to give that really rapid response um, and really effective response which meant that their death toll was lower. Whereas if we look at Nepal, because of their being a low income country and having less money, they were sort of hindered by poverty. They were reliant on aid and support from overseas and their, their years to make a full recovery are still ongoing. So I hope you can use this to help you with your case study, looking at areas of contrasting wealth uh, for a tectonic hazard such as an earthquake.